<laughs> didn't. Oh, there it is. Oh, it didn't? Okay. I, oh, maybe it was just telling me to announce it. So I'm announcing it. It's being recorded. Hey. Okay. Don't say anything you can't unsay. <laughs> it's, this is a public meeting, if I am not understood correctly. <laughs> so it is. All the normal things apply. Yep. We don't get any attendees, but um, okay, good. So let's see, we'll go back to sharing this one. Um, okay, so this is the information from the water status webpage. Um, Atkins Reservoir levels, and you can see they rebounded um, pretty well. As of the end of December, we're, we're back up to full, which is good. And similar to other years, we're a little bit higher than a few, few of the other years, definitely higher than the drought year of 2016. So things are looking good. Oh, somebody joined. And we can also look at the water demand that's been happening this year in Amherst and is on our webpage. Um, Similar to the beginning of the year, the demand has it's just been low. It's been a lot lower this year. The only month that it, it got close to previous levels and a little bit higher was June. But September, October, the last three months, September, October, November, um, it's been much lower and, it, and it's dropping. We don't have the December data yet, but so, so that, that's all positive for our water supply. Um, so we're really in good shape right now. I know uh, we haven't gotten a lot of snow, so the winter um, is questionable again, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But as of right now, we're in good shape. Going back to the previous uh, Atkins uh, water levels, the, the low point uh, level is managed because when it gets too low, we simply use other supplies. Yes. Is that a correct statement? Yes. The, I mean, you'll notice this year it, it went a little lower than other years. And, you know, partly we had some other sources that we were resting or doing some maintenance on knowing that the demand wasn't as high. And so it, you know, kind of got a little lower than than we would normally try to manage it. Normally we would try to reduce, if not, you know, shut off Atkins for a little bit as it was getting to some of these lower uh, numbers. But, you know, some of, we were playing the game of maintaining some of our other sources so they would be, you know, available and good to go when the students come back, so. Sure, but my point is simply that the, that the low is a managed level, uh, and not something that we need to be concerned about. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we look at this on a regular basis and, you know, as it's starting to get to a level that raises concern for us, then we do adjust sources to manage how low that gets. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any more um, questions about what's on? our water supply webpage right now. This is the precipitation for 2020, which actually, I mean, it felt like it was a, a, a definitely, it felt like there, were, there was a drought this summer, but when you look at precipitation, it was actually closer to, to the 10-year um, monthly average uh, than 2016 was by quite a bit. Um, So that's what we have. That's it, and we keep updating that web page monthly. All right. Um, next on the agenda is water infrastructure projects update, and we've got we've got a lot of big projects going on right now. A lot of a lot of 
move forward quite a bit on a lot of things. Um, Amy's going to talk mostly about this, I guess, Centennials first. So Amy, you want me to bring up the plans? Yeah, if you just want to bring up those 30% plans, just if people are interested at all in looking at that. And I think you want to go to like page three, maybe the first, this is like a process diagram. Um, but I think page three at least gives the lay of the land a little bit, or that's the existing this site. One. Okay, sorry, one more page. This one? No, okay. this one. So this is, um, this right here is the 30% design drawing. We actually last week had our 75% um, design drawing. So this, um, the design of the new Centennial is moving right along. Um, you know, and again, you guys are aware of this, but you know, we're looking at um, dissolved air flotation. So DAF technology uh, for this. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a different footprint. It's gonna be a little more set back off the road, um, which we're excited about. Um, that lagoon swale area in the back is gonna be, they actually in the 75% design, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot smaller. Um, yeah. I don't know what questions you guys have. We're, we're more just excited, although we're looking at, you know, seven pounds worth of design documents right now to try to review all of that. So. Um, Amy, can Amy. you refresh my memory? Did, 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 um, did you receive a waiver re regarding the net zero bylaw? So we didn't, it's, it's, so, it falls into a weird space because it's in Pelham. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I think the net zero energy is technically written for buildings in Am like Amherst town buildings in Amherst. And so we don't technically fall within the bylaw. Um, it's just, it's just kind of a, an odd loophole. Um, we're not 100% sure if it applies to this building anyway, because it's an industrial building, you know, it's a treatment plant and, um, you know, net zero energy would be pretty hard to achieve given the size of the pumps and, you know, the, um, the air generator for uh, the, the DAF technology and all of that. Um, that being said, that has been part of the conversation with the select board. And so we're going to do what we can to make it as energy efficient as possible. Um, they're like, they're doing things such as you know, the roof, like the rating of the roof, they're gonna make sure that it has that little extra bit of like um, rating on it so that if we put solar panels up there, it can handle the weight of solar panels. Like they're, they're taking some of those steps in the design to leave the door open for that in the future. Um, but yeah, technically I, I don't believe we fall within the, the um, mandate of that regulation. And hopefully if you did, I mean, this is the classic example of why it's not a great regulation because in a blanket statement that this would need a waiver. waiver. I mean, this is a, a constrained site, one place to put it, can't do anything. So very, very challenging to meet a blanket type thing like that. So I yeah. would hope that a waiver would be straightforward for this application. Um, Amy, uh, as I've said in the past, happy to engage. Appreciate that. I'm here. Appreciate you know what I you know what I know. Yep. <laughs> okay. What's the expected uh, construction phasing? Uh, start date finished, and what's the design capacity of the plant? So the design capacity it's going to be um, 1.5 with three trains. Um, so. I can send you, if you're interested, they actually have a like seven or eight page document that just kind of lays out all the design criteria. Um, yes. Are you interested in that? Okay, I'm, I'm happy to share that. Um, Maybe the whole committee is. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share that. I with certainly am, I certainly am. I, you're like, I find that information cool. I don't know that everyone else does. <laughs> um, but, oh yeah, and then you were asking timeline. So um, the timeline for this, um, we're hoping to get through um, the rest of design and permitting. There's a lot of permitting that has to happen as well. So we're hoping to get through that through, you know, the spring and early summer and then go through um, bidding process. Um, so we think we're probably two years out from this being done, done. Um, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't start construction until, you know, optimistically in the fall. And it might be later than that, given, um, you know, just 
permitting timelines that seem to be taking a little longer right now with everything else that's going on. Um, so, do you, are the cost estimates still pretty much the same as they were? Um, on an order of magnitude, <laughs> <laughs> um, they've they've gone up just a little bit. Um, but they're still within the same ballpark. So we did get an appropriation for, um, I believe it was 11 million for this yeah. and the cost estimate that we just saw with 75% was at, I think 13.2. So obviously it's above that. And, you know, right now we don't, the 30% design estimate I think was at like 12, eight. And so, you know, like the, the number keeps shifting a little bit. So right now we're trying to decide when we go to the select board, if we have to ask for more or whether we start having the value engineering conversation. Um, so that's kind of the point that we're in right now with that. Yeah, it will, it never goes down. It only goes up, but it only goes, I know. <laughs> it, it's what, close. Amy, what's this, what sort of availability or what's the, the, the situation with, uh, with financing in terms of money, uh, you know, what kind of, bond uh, interest rate terms and or are we getting any state revolving fund money? I don't know the answer to all of that, although we we certainly we could get that. It's in it's in my budget books. I just don't have that right in front of me um, in terms of what the, the bond rate. I, I believe it's a 20 year loan um, and whatever the standard um, interest was for a bond when they um, first yeah. appropriated for it last year. Although I think at that point they just assume because we don't. Yeah, I don't know if they, okay. Yeah. Like, and, um, that being said, we, we haven't done um, SRF for it. Um, yeah. So I can state my opinion on SRF or we can leave it at that. <laughs> Did, let's leave it at that. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any more questions on Centennial? Okay, um, next on our agenda is well number four. Stop sharing my screen, there we go. And um, I can talk a little bit about that and then Amy can probably talk a little bit about it too. Well number four is off of Southeast Street. It's the well that's connected to baby carriage um, treatment plant, just so you guys a little refresher. And we're um, drilling a replacement well for well number four. I think we talked about this before about its um, capacity issues. Um, and drilling is supposed to start next week. So we're pretty excited about that too. Yay, moving forward. Um, it's permitted. It's, uh, it's got all its uh, DEP permitting that it needs. And we, yeah, we finally got everything ready and the drillers are supposed to come out next week. And the, so that's great. It, I mean, I think the drilling is only going to probably take a couple weeks. Um, we run a pump test, we do sampling, and then we communicate again with DEP to, to get moving, having it uh, actually running. So that's all I know. Amy, did you want to say anything else about well number four? I guess the only thing I'll add, like the permitting ended up being a little more than we anticipated, like the timeline for it and the responses from the DEP. And so that's that's why I feel like six months ago when we had the meeting, it was like, oh, we're just submitting the permitting. We should be hearing from them soon. And, you know, it's it's been we've spent those last six months basically um, with ongoing communications with the DEP to get the permit. So what what's the depth on that? Well, the new one you're drilling. Is it what is this? 170 maybe? 70? I wanted to say 172. Yeah, it's 170. Yeah. So the goal is to access screen about the same level, same aquifer. It's not how close, how close to the uh, horizontally to the other, the existing one? It's about 40 feet. I think. Yeah, no, and it's going to be screened. Yeah, in the same, same aquifer. And um, so we did, we did a temporary well and everything was was great with that the pump test the sampling um with the small temporary well and that was last spring i think we did that and uh so everything looks like like it's going to be good hopefully the manganese and iron levels are similar to well four no, no big right. surprises no big surprises i hope right they were with the temporary well sampling um and like i said once this is drilled we'll we'll be sampling again 
So we did for the temporary well, you know, sometimes you do an observation well, and then where you put the new well is a couple of feet offset from this. This instead, we put a temporary well, and we're going to pull that and put the new one in the same spot. Mm -hmm. uh, because we already have observation wells in that area. So this was more just, you know, let's do it once and, and confirm that this is a good spot. New, same new vertical turbine pump. It's gonna be a new, yeah. It's it's gonna be a new pump. Um, yeah, Not it's gonna vertical. be a, um, yeah, vertical turbine pitless adapter that goes into the existing building and, um, you know, using the fact that we do have a well house, but the new well will not be within the well house. So kind of similar to what we did at well number two when we replaced well number two, just outside the well two house. So, yeah. So you just have the pump on top of the, the vertical turbine on top of the well, but not the well house, not a whole well house. Right. Sorry, no, it's a submersible no. pump. Because I was going to say, because if unless you'd have a well house, you don't have a vertical turbine pump. You don't have a vertical house, turbine so. It's a submersible. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. Yeah. So it's, it's a change into a submersible. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But and using the existing infrastructure of the well house with. Yeah, it's controls and. Yeah. yeah, all the controls will be in there. We'll wire, you know, controls out to that. Um, we're actually leaving the existing pump still online, you know, so now like so basically if anything happens to this pump and we yep. have to pull the pump or something, we could pump from the existing one on a yeah. rare basis. Um, but yeah, the control wiring and access to sampling and all of that stuff will be in the existing pump house. And then where it actually tees in is gonna be just outside the pump house. Mm. Um, Did it require a new variable frequency drive or the same when you, a new drive too for the pump? I believe it needs a new drive because the pump is gonna be, because of its, because it's submersible, I guess it needs a slightly different like a sure. slightly higher horsepower. Yeah, um, different stuff. Yep. That's my understanding. Yep. Yeah. Neat. Yep. So we're excited about that one. Yeah. That's moving forward. What's the um, horsepower on that? I don't know offhand. Um, again, with, with all of these questions, if, if you want us to send you, you know, I can send you information afterwards, like send that around to the committee if you guys are interested in that. Yes. Yeah, I'd be curious. Yeah, I, I just like to keep tabs for knowing and teaching. <laughs> so great. I'll I'll Thank send you. around. We we pro we must have a just like what we sent to the DEP for the permit or something. So I'm sure we've got yeah. some pretty accessible yeah. information that we can share. That um, who's drilling? Who's doing the drilling? It's Mahar. The Mahar drilling. They did the temporary well too. Yeah. They were good. Yeah. Beth, sorry, say the name again. Mahar. M, I think it's M A H E R. Mayor. Yeah, Mayor. I, Mayor. I thought it was Mayor. Mayor. Yeah. Is it Mayor? Oh, I thought they, they pronounced it Mahar. I don't know. No, that's a high school. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's Mayor. Mm. Uh, All right. In Massachusetts drilling wells so okay well if um i guess we're done with well number four discussion we can move on to the water line extension into she leverage froze. everybody froze everybody froze uh, for me but i'm not oh. back no I, everybody's okay for me hmm. oh and now you're back you were gone for a minute now you're back yeah which makes no sense since I have a hardwire connection in an office at UMass, but who knows, right? <laughs> it's about the most robust I could be. Oh, well. <laughs> All right, let's share the plans for Lever Road. Yeah, I guess this is all. Yeah, it's kind of because it's so long, you have multiple pages, but it's basically, you know, the water yeah. line extension from um, our last connection on East Levert Road and, you know, g continuing up East Levert Road. Um, you kind of show the next one. Um, yeah. 
continue, you know, continuing all the way up. What's the length, total length? It's um, 9,500 linear feet, approximately. Size and material? It is a, I want to say. We're, we're it, making this space because partly we're going to leave some of that open to bid. I, I believe we finally talked them into 12 inch diameter, but during the bid, we're going to have, we're going to do the bid as the C909 and have a bid alt to do it as ductile iron or vice versa. Um, so we're going to look at prices and decide on the material um, based on prices and, you know, based on ultimately that that'll be the tiebreaker. Um, Jason will talk about it in a second. We did put C909 on um, the West Pomeroy Lane. And I guess that's the first time we've used it in our system, but I know like South Hadley Fire District number one is using it extensively and they're um, a big fan. And so, you know, we, we think that that might be the right material here and it's, you know, more cost effective. So uh, that's our hope, but. Mm -hmm. And so it goes. It goes, yeah, it, you just showed it like goes up and turns on T Waddle and then goes down that, that bottom one there shows down on T Waddle. C900, right? No, it's right. C909. Say I'm waiting for. I know Jason, you know better than I yeah, do the trade. No, well, the, the, there's. It's got a few sort of trade nicknames, but the 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 one that sticks the most is the C909. Um, hmm. I'm just googling it real quick. Yeah, okay. me too. I've, not 900 is common, but uh, yeah, the yeah. 909 Ooh. is a whole lot more flexible, and that's why South Hadley um, prefers it. The 900 is um, it's a slightly thicker walled, but extremely rigid and can be fragile. It, it will shatter as opposed to flex. Whereas right. C909 has, has some really, the, the guys from South Hadley sent me some pretty cool videos of them playing around with an excavator in their, in their, uh, mm. in their yard. They crushed a piece of C900 and it shattered into billions of pieces. It looked pretty dangerous actually. <laughs> and the, they took a piece of C909 and they were able to crush it and it actually rebounded back to semi-round. It didn't didn't go exactly back to round, but it didn't right. rupture at all. So we, we, we like that material. It gives us a little more confidence, you know, because it's real easy to put an excavator tooth through a piece of C900 and blow a water main out. Whereas if you, you know, we, that's why we like ductile is because you can hit it with an excavator, you know it's there and you don't necessarily end up with an instant leak. So we feel more comfortable with the C909, cool. a little bit more resilient. So it's quite a new pipe, relatively new. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah. So it's the, like the move from cast iron to ductile iron. That's nice. Exactly. Yeah. Brittle PVC to flexible. Mm -hmm. PVC. Good. Ultra blue, I see it's advertised as. Yes. That's <laughs> Jam Eagles Ultra Blue is the other, yeah. It's the other trade ultra. name. You can, Not you can, just blue, but ultra. Yeah. You can Google all sorts of fun videos showing excavators crushing the stuff. <laughs> You would think Amherst would only put an ultra blue pipe, huh? <laughs> well, our water department is sold on it after they did um, West Pomeroy for sure. It's much easier to work with. Good. So this this is going. We're working on the permitting right now uh, for this project, and I'm assuming we're going to bid and possibly do next summer. Is that right, Amy? Yeah, East um, or Leverett, the town of Leverett is really hot to trot on this. And so they're, they're kind of driving, um, driving this pretty good, but, you know, looking to, you know, bid maybe they want like end of this winter, early spring for um, construction over the summer. Um, so we're just, you know, picking our way through the permitting process. Um, the one difference, we don't have the finalized design drawings. The one difference between, you know, you look at this drawing here and it has it, um, you know, serving all of the houses on T Waddle um, before there's a little stream and then it goes up the hill. And I guess um, on the other side, Beth, where it says limit of work right in that area is like where oh, yeah. the, the end of work was initially. Um, I, we're also going to do at least at this time a bid alt to 
go under that stream and serve the next house. Um, it wasn't originally in the scope, but I guess Leverett found that the house on the other side of that river um, tested for some background levels of PFOS. And so the DEP may at some point make the leap that um, that PFOS is also because of the landfill and have them connect to water. And so at this point, they're not sure if they're gonna do it or not, um, but we're gonna do a bit all to at least extend to that one house if they decide they wanna provide water to that house pre preemptively. So um, ultimately a leverage decision, but that that's kind of the one major change since this um, set of design drawings that we're showing. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question on the Leverett project at all? All right. Um, yeah, I had one question. Sorry, I was on mute. How do we get? How do we get by the uh, relatively new new bridge that uh, was put in six seven years ago? If they're uh, going to directional dr uh, directional drill underneath. Under the bridge, under the under the stream. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. That would be for both streams if they extend it across the right. the stream on T Waddle. Yes. Yeah, they'll directionally drill there as well. So we thought that was much easier than any other option for stream crossing at this point. Yeah, it's much easier for all the wetland permitting. Definitely. And you don't have to mess with the bridge. Right. Exactly. It's a win win. That too. <laughs> all right. Um, if there's no more questions on that, we'll move on in the agenda to the water line replacement. Uh, and West Pomeroy and Jason, I thought you could sort of summarize that works so all. Yeah, that, that that project came out really nice. Um, we did temporary piping along the uh, side of the road for all the house. All it was all of six houses, um, and it's 900 feet of pipe that we had to replace. This was the section I showed you guys that piece of uh, Swiss cheese ductile iron pipe, and we were just getting a leak there. You know, last winter, I think we had three leaks spring up and most of them on holidays, of course, where the guys had to come in and, and patch another hole, patch another hole. They just kept finding more and more holes. Um, so we decided, made the final decision to just rip it all out and replace it. Um, so we installed temporary water main down the side of the road, fed that to the six houses, um, and then went in and started pulling out the ductile iron and replacing it with the C909. Um, everything came out really nice. We added a couple of hydrants. Um, we did ductile iron for all the hydrants and fittings um, and just transitioned back to C909 every time um, for the mainline stuff. Um, and yeah, it went out and came out really smooth. The highway department and the water department worked together on it. Um, and, and they really, they I forget it, it probably took about two to three weeks. Well, it took a couple of weeks to set up the temporary main. Then it was a couple of weeks, I think it was three weeks of excavating and replacing main um, and uh, and then testing and, and cleanup. So it came out really nice. We had Warner Brothers do the uh, trench patch and um, everything came off really nicely. We had a little bit of hard time pressurizing it. Um, it, it behaves a little differently than ductile, I guess, as far as doing the pressure testing. Um, but we, we figure we got it, we got it nailed down pretty good. Um, so yeah, I guess 900 feet of pipe, three weeks. Um, it came out really nice. The guys love it. It's the pipe is so much easier to work with. You don't have to, you don't have to have the excavator sling it into the trench with, for you because the guys can actually pick, you know, two people can easily pick up a piece of pipe, um, at least the eight inch anyways. So um, it, yeah, it worked out. It worked out really nice. And the service lines were you just replaced a little bit of Copper connected. Yeah, to the, we went. We went from the main to their curb stop, basically to replace. Yeah, to replace replaced to the curb stop. Found all their curb stops and and went and replaced from one to the other. Good. Man. Tapping goes well. The the crew likes tapping. Of this yeah, yeah, it was nice and easy. We did saddle yeah. saddle taps for all of them. Good. Um, but yeah, it worked out nice. We they ran all the main line first, and we did the pressure test, bacteria test, and chlorinated chlorinated the line. Um, and then once once we made sure there was no bacteria, bacteria samples came back negative. We went ahead and tapped all the services and reconnected them, and and disconnected the temp main and and uh, hauled all the ductile iron out. So we didn't see as much 
we didn't get any great Swiss cheese samples that came out. I was expecting a whole lot more Swiss cheese pipe uh, to come out of the ground, but it, there, there was a lot of evidence that there, I think the tar coating on the ductile that came out, there was a lot of like missing tar coating where there was gravel mm. stuck to the bottom of the pipe in a mm. lot of cases. So that was the only thing really noticeable that, and, and, you know, if that, that rust were to progress, it would, you know, eventually eat through the pipes. So I expect we would have seen more breakers, breaks there this, this winter, but um, we, we preemptively uh, removed it. So we're happy we didn't have to go out there any, for any winter repairs. So, but yeah, everything else on that project came out really nice. Glad the job went well. I wouldn't describe the road as always smooth and <laughs> as one who uses it a lot, but it was great <laughs> during construction as normal, but it was, uh, yeah. it was great. It was great. Mm -hmm. Nice that you got it done. All right. Um, any more questions on West Pomeroy? No? All right, so moving on, our 2020 um, lead and copper sampling. So we did that. We, we did all lead and copper sampling in October. Um, we sampled from 37 residences and two schools um, and our 90th percentile uh, measurements were below action levels and everything went really smoothly. Um, the schools we sampled were the UMass uh, Center for Early Education Care and the All About Learning facility on Pomeroy Lane. Um, so yeah, so we don't have to do that potentially for another three years. I don't, every, I'm assuming some of you all know that the, the lead and copper rule got revised and the, the new regulations got put into the federal register just in the last uh, couple of weeks. So last Friday. last Friday, yeah. So, you know, we've, we've looked through that. We, we kind of have a, a good grip on it, but we need to look at it more. And I'm, I'm waiting for um, DEP's direction. They, you know, they, they tend to take something like this and put together forms and put together a whole plan for communities on how to move forward and what your requirements are. And I'm, you know, we're sort of waiting for that to see how, where Amherst fits in. But, um, you know, we were on a schedule where we did our lead and copper sampling every three years and we'll see where it goes from here. But, um, but it was good to get it in this year in 2020 and kind of have, have some very recent data. What's the new action levels? Um, the, for lead, the action level is still um, 0 0.015 milligrams per liter, but there's this zero um, point, what is it? Point zero ten milligrams per liter where you, you still have to do something at 10 now. So it is a little bit more restrictive. Um, copper stays the same at 1.3 milligrams per liter. So yeah, so we need to, to get a good grip on those. What was that, Brian? What was the copper level? 0 0.013? No, 1.3. 1.3, OK. 1.3 milligrams per liter is copper. Yeah. yeah. And that's that, you know our, what, uh, what the 90th percent level for Amherst for the homes was for, for lead? For lead? Um, yeah, what the number was. I know you said less than the AL, but what? What was the number? Yep, it was 0 0.0071. 7.1 micrograms? OK. Yeah. You know, just to put a, one quick comment in context, so you know I'm a, very involved in this. Um, DEP's goal for schools is one PPB or less. That's that's what we want schools to achieve. Uh, it's extremely stringent. Uh, it's appropriate from a health perspective, but uh, it's it's very uh, stringent. So um, it the, the national rule didn't go very far, but it went in a in a good direction, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, I mean, I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Uh, the water industry failed us. We we and I'm part of it. We we kept using lead long, 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 like centuries after we should have. Uh, so uh, you know we got to deal with it. It's it's can't put our head in the sand. It's a past problem we caused and we need to fix it. So uh, I'm going to encourage DEP and I don't know what they'll come out to, but my own strong personal preference is there's no almost no benefit to taking two samples from a school. There's there's just 
It's just, okay, two samples. Um, mm -hmm. There is no representative sample from a school. Sample all the fixtures or don't, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. So that's just, uh, you know, I strongly urge towns to take, uh, now put on my board of health hat, uh, to, to take uh, as strong as measure as possible to protect the health of our kids. So, uh, mm -hmm. so measuring, uh, uh, doing schools appropriately is what needs to be done. I know Emerson, oh, Amy, uh, school department, SWIG, got, we got a SWIG grant. Did any of those fixtures get installed? I don't know. I'll, All right. I'll ask. You guys okay. should I mean, know. The, the reality right. is they would have done the installation with that, I but yeah. I did tell them, you know, call me when they're in and I'm happy to do the sampling for you. Um, and I hadn't heard. Okay, that'd be but. great. I'll yeah, and if you do this, answer. if if you get involved in that, and what should have been done to please the deal, please, please make sure the you use the lab that does the EDBP upload, because the SWIG grant requires compliance with DP's LCCA program. You can't use the lab just because it's cheap, because it's um, and it doesn't do EDP upload. We've talked through this before. If if it doesn't go into the tool, you haven't met the requirements of the program to get the grant. Uh, we are. Our program, our staff people are, are talking with people all the time who don't get it and they do the wrong thing and they got to do it again. So. Hey there, John, can you just remind me what EDP means there? Sorry, um, EDP is the electronic upload from labs directly into the DEP database. Ah. And it's required for certain types of analyses. For example, the next topic that's happening uh, <laughs> uh, is, is under certain programs. So. Um, Thank you. This one, it feeds information into what's called the LCCA program management tool, which is an online place that schools can look at their data, track their data, note changes, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, the LCR, it'll be different your next time. <laughs> I know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It will, but it's great. all good. That's a, that's a good having result. A, <laughs> having the labs uh, directly upload skips the middle person. So, so that there's no delay in the upload when it, it gets to DEP at the same time, it gets to the uh, person who submitted the sample, the results do. Yeah, that seems like a good check on the system. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just speak in the, in the defense when we were doing the sampling at the schools because one set of ours got sent to the DEP, they started analyzing it for our 15th percentile. And, you know, like it somehow got kicked into the wrong that system and we nearly got a violation because we were doing the sampling at the school. So it, it is good in some ways with checks and balances, but it also, you know, unfortunately, if it's not handled properly on the other end, it's, it's sometimes, you know, yeah. more harm than good. Remember, uh, that was, that was, that was August 2016. You were the first school in our entire program of which we did 800 schools. We had to train the labs that this is not, um, I mean, it wasn't, they, yeah, it wasn't like a required sample that would No, go. and there is no MCL. I mean, the labs treated this number like an MCL and they're just dead wrong. The lab was dead wrong on what they did. So, uh, and it didn't happen again once, once they learned. So yeah, you, and remember you guys were the guinea pig. There was the program was getting going. It was local. We could do it. <laughs> we got uh, and and it was great that it was done, and it pointed out significant issues with those buildings, which we expected, and they need to be addressed. So I mean, it, it's all all right. Um, but yeah, uh, labs. It's a challenge for labs to to to. They like to show numbers and and they've got some reporting requirements. So they're going to err on the side of over reacting and over-reporting then under. So, um, oh yeah, the result was coming off the GC to Dave Reckow and me, like each sample. <laughs> the, this is over the MCL. And we said, no, there is no MCL. This is just a reporting number. This is a program. Uh, so don't tell us the result every time a sample comes off the AA or whatever it is, the ICPMS. So that took a little bit of training. So, but it, yeah, it, uh, I hear you. I, I understand that uh, getting getting violation notices is um, not fun on the water supply side for sure, especially mistaken ones. Right. Oh. All right. So no more questions on LCR. We can move on to PFAS, our other popular contaminant. Um, 
So we, I'm gonna, John, I'm gonna give you a chance to definitely talk all about PFOS, but I just wanted to mention, so we are, we will be sampling, Amherst will be sampling in 2021. Um, we start in April uh, and you have the sort of initial monitoring is uh, four, four quarters in a row. So we'll start in April. Um, and we have to do uh, our entry points from our from all of our sources. So it's looking like we're going to be collecting five samples um, quarterly this year for our initial monitoring. And then based on the results of that, we see um, what future monitoring Amherst is going to have to do. But that this is the start of DEP's PFOS program. So, and I know John knows a lot more about it. So maybe he could share information. Um, encourage you to get the first quarter for free through the program that we're running, helping DEP run. They don't know if there's a reason not to, but if there is, uh, I'd be curious to know it. Um, but I would, I would get the first quarter free because we're out, it's up being offered and then, then you're on your own. Um, extensive QC things going on with these lab results that Massachusetts is way very different than a lot of other states. There's only a few states with MCLs. Um, Vermont's one, for example, uh, Massachusetts does. So we're really working hard. We have a lot of people spending time on QCing and working with the labs. This is a very difficult analysis and difficult to get rid of. And the levels, the 20 PPT for PFAS-6. So PFAS-6 is the sum of six compounds and they need to be less than 20 PPT. But if there's any detect at all, we do a confirmatory sample. There's a lot of nuances to this, so it's a challenge. And the labs are just starting EDP, just like almost actually, right, right about now. So we got good labs, we got challenging labs. It's 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 an interesting time. So um, I guess are that, some towns starting in January? Are some is there sampling being done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we uh, 300 PWS is in the system so far that we we. Yeah. Part of the the large one started in okay. January, and then the medium start in April, and then the small right. start in June or July. Right. Yeah, right. so that's kind and, of and anybody who wanted to get going on this could use a, a sample as their first quarter. In other words, you could use anything done appropriately in the, in recent times as your first sample. So, you, I mean, there's you can use some historical legacy measurements. So, um, doing that. Uh, uh, there's also a private well sampling program you may hear about. I mentioned this before. Uh, Belchertown's the pilot town, <laughs> our next door neighbor, and postcards went out to uh, owners there asking them to volunteer. Um, we're just getting the process going. We'll see what happens. It's a document you got to sign. Um, there's a lot of questions about the program. Uh, DP's, DP's, the goal is to, to get a sense of how extensive PFAS contamination is in the Commonwealth, you know, in the, in the waters of the Commonwealth, so. Uh, How many towns are going to do the residential, the private well? I guess not the residential. There are 83 communities with 60% or more of the residents receive their drinking water from private wells. So there's currently 83 communities on the list. And interesting, Belchertown is one of the bigger, like population Belchertown is 15,000, 11,000 people get their water from private wells, 12,000, something like that. It's one of the bigger, but most of the communities are 400 and 500, you know. Things like that. So, um, there are communities that have already had issues, like and have asked for measurements, like Leverett. Uh, some private wells in Leverett have been measured. Um, there are communities that. Um, that did you say four or five hundred? Four or five hundred uh, wells, or four or five hundred population? People, people. Uh, yeah, I didn't say exactly what we're doing. Uh, the goal of the program is to get samples from twenty to forty wells per per community, and. Uh, huge amount of background work going on to identify a subset of wells that are targeted based on potential releases and then a subset of random wells. And the targeted releases are largely related to landfills, industry and firefighting activities. So there's discussions going with on with communities. You find out there was a big truck fire, a vehicle fire someplace. So AFFF, uh, the firefighting foam was used and it's now a potential, very likely groundwater contaminant uh, source. So uh, so chapter uh, 21E has waste people, they get roped in pretty quickly. So if you do it well and it's above like 90 uh, PPT, you're now in the has waste cleanup side of the world. So um, 
there's, you know, responsible part, all the discussions that go along with hazardous waste sites stuff uh, kick in. It's challenging. So John, do you expect that all 83 of those communities will participate? Well, it's not about the communities, it's about to individuals. So uh, we're, we're right at the point uh, right now, nobody's agreed yet. We, we have, uh, we sent out 200 postcards in Belchertown 10 days ago and we got six people to sign up so far, or at least say they will sign up. The next step is to send them this agreement form. Now we'll see how many agreement forms come back. Um, and uh, that we're right there at that moment right now. Okay. This, this project has about eight subgroups. We have calls, I don't know, three or four subtopics a week, 15 people on a call in private wells, DEP, UMass Amherst, UMass Lowell. Uh, it's, it's a huge program. Uh, I don't know what quite, uh, we got GIS. GIS is extensively involved, state GIS and uh, mapping, trying to lay this stuff out, so. I, it's interesting, you know, the state really has not done comprehensive private well water testing, right? It's, it's not that we, we, it's a very loose thing. There's not much requirement. So, so in each community, the, the outreach is to the Board of Health to try to meet with Board of Health and, and the fire, fire department, police department, find out stuff and say, here, we're going to send out these postcards. And um, you got communities don't have the time of day for it. And you've got uh, communities full of very active, it's a huge hot topic. So an interesting thing. What's, what's the owner's responsibility if the limits come back higher and it becomes a hazard waste? It's described in a, in a sheet of paper in a, that I think it's sent to the homeowner and um, it'll, it, it becomes one of um, level and if it can be determined if the source of the contamination is on site or off site. In other words, are you be, uh, a being harmed party or a harming party? That's that kind of, so are you a potentially rep responsible party or are you being harmed by an upstream source? So up gradient, up something source. So all the, all the words are caveats that say you may be subject to requirements under chapter 21E to take blah, blah, blah. I mean, that, the words are there, so it depends. Which, which in essence means that you may, if if it's detected, you may either need to filter first um, before you consume it uh, in any way, uh, or have an alternate water supply. Mm -hmm. Figure out an alternate water supply. That's another. Who pays for cleanup? Filtering is wonderful if it's my well and I'm drinking it, but what about the rest of the story? Yeah, I mean, if if you depends you're if it's your part, your issue or if, right, whether if you the, own it or not. Right. If you're the responsible party, you, you own it. It's, that's now that's that's an issue. If you're not, then the other parties that that's a different, right? And and that takes money to do that type of research to find out who is sure does, causing yeah. the problem. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. I hope that's well spelled out for the people that are signing that form? You know, uh, that's a topic where, uh, yeah, the legal folks at DEP and 21E are all involved in that particular form. So at the moment, I don't know if we'll get anybody to sign up, to be honest, if I got to be straight up honest, right? That's, yeah. uh, we got, we have 30 or 40 people who've uh, signed up, quote, and a bunch of those are from communities that are not actually on that list of 81, but there's a whole bunch of interested homeowners. And if, you, and if you're diligent, you can find the sign up link on the website, even though you weren't invited to sign up, but you can find it. <laughs> it's it's if semi public. <laughs> if, if you live near a likely source and you're concerned about it, then you'll likely sign up because you'll feel that the likelihood is if they find something in your world that it belongs to the neighboring source or the upgradient source. And ultimately you would be the beneficiary of somebody else's remedial pro project. True. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, I don't know why you would sign up. 
uh, unless you're really concerned about the possibility of that being in your water supply. Because if it comes in at you know a, a very mildly detected level, um, you're still on the hook. Yeah. And the levels are incredibly small. So anyway, the town, I hope our water supplies from a PWS perspective um, are, are good. Um, yeah, uh, Granby is a town that has private wells, for example, but there are on the order of 19 PWSs in Granby. So I'm talking about a school, a building, a non-trend, right? So, you know, Amy knows this really well about how most public water supplies are tiny. There are vast numbers of them. And uh, some towns have many, many, many PWSs. So um, it's those, those sources, some of those are coming up challenging. I mean, there are, I will say in the PWS sector, there's plenty of hits. Uh, there's a pretty good website, public website, dashboard, storyboard, story, story thing on the DEP website you can get to. So uh, yeah, we got to do, like you said, the source of the sample. You can get, by the, you can, if you, if you want, uh, get raw and treated sources. So you're required to do certain things, but um, you can get raw. So Baby Carrot's book, for example, raw and treated, you could get, or uh, Centennial raw and treated. I encourage you to do both. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, I would. Especially the free one the first time. <laughs> right. Uh, as you say, I mean, I were just talking yesterday about that, that grant program. So, so. Yeah, what's the time? Hmm? If we, if we're sampling in April and we want to take advantage of the funds, when, we sh when should we be submitting to? Um, any, any time, uh, you know, get in the queue. Um, it, the path is through the regions. To us, uh, there's the Margaret Finn DEP basically releases PWSs to the program when the regions have vetted them. Said, okay, yeah, you want to do it. And you know, the state, the regions are a bit of a fiefdomish thing. So, no, -uh. no, nah, nah, never. <laughs> Wero, Ciro, Nero, all those, yeah. Okay. And I'd never come across another state yeah. that had such regional differences, especially a tiny freaking state. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Crazy. It makes no sense. Uh, makes no sense, but I'm glad we're in the western region. <laughs> um, eh, depends. Depends. I, I've heard other regions in the state are are a little more collaborative than the western region. <laughs> right. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> really has a comment to uh, the chief. No. <laughs> In, in the hazardous hates us. Yeah. ways, I'm glad we're in the Western region. Yeah, well, I was gonna say it depends on the program. Yeah, yes. you know there right. are there are you some great Western region folks. I love these Perfect. subjects. I'm gonna say I gotta. I only got about two minutes. I gotta jump on a call with Springfield Water. Sorry. Okay, <clears throat> um, we can just quickly move on um, to watershed yeah. work. Um, yeah, we had the Atkins Dam inspected, so it, it needs to get a phase one inspection every two years. So we had uh, Ty and Bond came out in October and did an inspection, and um, we just got the final report actually, and it got submitted to to DCR, so the DCR Dam program. Um, we did we did all right. We got a, a fair rating, which is what we got two years ago, and the reason that we we're getting a fair um, reading instead of you know, good or is that we have a um, we have sort of a slow embankment seepage on the left side, on the down downslope left side, and it's been there for a while. We're we were already aware of it. It wasn't something that we just found out about with this inspection. Um, and the recommendation from Time Bond and kind of what we've we've been trying to do the last last couple of years is monitor it and sort of assess it. Um, we had been doing a little bit of measuring uh, with a weir and we need to get back to doing that now that we've got this new inspection report we'll get back to doing that um, so that's you know that that's a project and but but we got a fair re rating which is which is great there was a lot of positive things they they had to say about the maintenance of the dam hey um, Beth 
Um, yep. A few years, a few years back, when I was teaching groundwater, um, we tried to measure the seepage out of the dam, and the yeah. discharge, the discharge was too low to measure. We used a, a, a salt tracer technique where you, you dump salt upstream and then try to measure it downstream, and basically oh, cool. the, the, the flow or the advection of the salt water uh, was slower than the diffusion of the salt, um, and so. We didn't get a good measurement. If that, I, I don't know what the lower threshold is, but that was, I think, 2016. It was the fall of the bad drought. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind was the dam, the reservoir was about eight feet lower stage than full, um, but we, we couldn't detect any, basically. We could see yeah. a tiny bit of seepage, but could, it was too low to measure for what that's oh. worth. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that, um, that UMass had done that. That's cool. Yeah, it was yeah. just a, it was a a lab as part of a class doing uh, reservoir sort of balance, try to see water in, water out. So we were trying to measure all the water out points, but we, we couldn't get a, a discharge out of the seepage. Cool. Yeah, during the inspection this year, again, the water was, was really low, which actually I think may have benefited us a little with when time bond was out there. But again, it was a hard year this year to measure anything because the reservoir levels were so low. Um, so that is that. Uh, does anybody have any more questions about that? No? Okay. Um, moving on, something else we've been working on in the watershed is um, something that we had Brian work on is the Pelham Reservoir sediment study. We're, we're heading eventually into dredging the reservoirs and also the sedimentation basins at Atkins. So right now we're just collecting data um, to eventually uh, put together a project like that. I mean, that would be a lot of permitting. Um, that's a, those are, it's a big, big project. Um, but so right now we're just really in the phase of collecting data. And I asked Brian to kind of talk a little bit this morning about what he found when he did the sediment study. Brian? Hi, Beth. Yeah, I'm just taking notes on the Atkins thing still. Um, so for Pal, I prepared slides, but the Zoom format here is unfamiliar to me. I don't see any, oh. I can't even turn on my video. because You can't see me, can you? No. no. Are you sharing your screen? No, no, I, I can't even turn on my, my video camera, much less screen sharing. I don't know why. It's like, it looks like a town meeting format where the only thing I can do is. Yeah. It's probably not a presenter. That's We're the stuff I had as like the panel is going to I got to go to another meeting. Uh, oh, thanks. Sweet. Sorry. Okay. To, yeah. Th yeah. Thanks for talking about all those important subjects. <laughs> They're all great. Yeah. Sorry, I got to go, but bye. Thank you for talking. Bye, John. Okay, bye. Bye, John. Bye. See y'all. Bye. Yeah, Brian, you joined as an attendee. Um, one thing you could do is go into your email and, f and find the email I sent you with a panelist link. Uh, okay, I'll be right back. I'll, I'll take me two seconds. Okay. <laughs> Well, we're waiting for him. Are there any other questions or topics that we want to hit on or that people have on their minds? No. I have one. <laughs> so I, I'm curious uh, about this uh, proposed wastewater uh, recycling line for irrigation. Yeah. And I, I just I don't know anything about this, but I, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm kind of affiliated with the Amherst Golf Club, and that was kind of discussed um, by Guilford and oh Brian's back. So, but at the end of the meeting we can talk, you to talk about, about that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, I'm not going to present a view because I'll try to save time. Uh, so. Briefly uh, looked at the sediment volumes in the Pelham reservoirs. These are the Pelham reservoirs. If you haven't been there or not familiar with them, um, Hill Reservoir is fed basically by the headwaters of Amethyst Brook. Um, I don't remember the actual name of the stream, but it's essentially Amethyst Brook. Um, Hawley Reservoir is the one you can see from Amherst Pelham Road. It's got that really pretty spillway that spills about eight months a year and now and then drops below the spillway. It's fed by a pretty small watershed, uh, Harris Brook. Um, and it's got sort of these two um, uh, wings of the reservoir, two arms of the reservoir. 
And then they, they merge just above the intake reservoir, and that's where the intake is for Centennial, which we were talking about earlier. Um, so this is the system we're looking at, and the town just wanted to know how much sediment's in them um, to plan for any possible dredging. Um, rather than do the summary at the end, I thought I'd just give you the summary at the beginning. Um, uh, the reservoirs are, in sum, about 20% full of sediment, and uh, they'll fill in about 400 to 700 years. Um, but that's a minimum estimate. Um, I did a really quick and dirty estimate. I calculated the trapping efficiency of each one and then looked at the sediment loads and adjusted the sediment loads for trapping efficiency. But the thing is, although the trapping efficiencies of the reservoirs uh, are sort of moderate right now, as you get more and more sediment in a reservoir, the residence time for water gets less and less. And so your trapping efficiencies decrease um, as you start to fill the reservoir. So you sort of have to do a differential approach to, to do a more sophisticated reservoir lifetime, which I didn't do. This is just sort of a minimum estimate. If the trapping efficiency stays the same, they'll fill up in about 500 years. <clears throat> um, dredging would restore, right now, would restore about 2 to 6% of the water storage of the reservoirs. And the reason it's not 20% is because a lot of the sediment that's in the reservoirs, um, that sediment volume is mostly water. So the porosity of the sediments are something like 70, 80, 90%. Um, and so um, if you remove uh, a, a yard of sediment, um, you don't restore a yard of storage, of water storage. You would only restore 20% of that yard because only 20% of it was actually filled with mineral material. Um, and the total volume of sediment is about 30,000 cubic yards in all the reservoirs. And that's the in situ volume. If you allowed it to dewater, the volume would be less. Um, and so I don't know much about dredging um, uh, procedures, but I would assume they could sort of pile it up, let it dewater for a time, and ultimately remove less volume. <clears throat> um, a little bit about the reservoirs. These are sort of some sort of metrics on the reservoirs. Um, so their volumes are about 10,000, 80,000, and 40,000 cubic meters. And you can see that. Um, Pauley Reservoir has a much smaller watershed than Hill Reservoir. The intake doesn't really have much of a watershed because as you recall, um, it's, it's down, downstream of the other two. Um, and so that 1.7 square kilometers is just the watershed area between intake and the upstream reservoirs. Um, so the total watershed area is about 16 square kilometers. And then I'll just show you some maps of the, the sediment if you want to see them. Any questions before I jump into the maps? All right, this is Holly Reservoir. Um, the color corresponds to sediment thickness, and the thickest sediment um, is about a meter thick. Um, but the sort of average sediment spread out over the reservoir is about, about a foot, about 30 centimeters of sediment across the reservoir. And the reservoir depth, average depth, is about six feet. Um, so that's at 20%. Um, here's Hill Reservoir. It's a much bigger reservoir um, than Holly. Um, and it's sort of, and it's much deeper too. So it's about 40 or 50 feet deep in this central basin. Uh, and so basically there's a big delta that has filled up the area near the inlet. Um, and then there's a sort of the, the toe of the delta right here. Um, sediment thicknesses in the delta are pretty thick. Um, and the sediment's pretty sandy. And then out here it's, it's mud. Um, pretty organic rich. Um, some nice event deposits in the in the sediment out here, probably corresponding to some big hurricane floods. And the I think you can see the 1955 hurricane in there. It's kind of neat for me, but um, it's not that much in terms of terms of total sediment. It's only about yay, maybe a centimeter. Um, so the the numbers here correspond to sediment thickness, uh, and then the yeah color is interpolated. And then the last one, this is the intake reservoir. I think this was last dredged in 1990. Is that right, Beth? Yep. This is the only one that has been dredged. Um, it's really tiny. Um, you could you can swim across it in about 10, no, maybe 20 seconds to swim across it, maybe a minute to swim the length of it. Um, by canoe, it's much less. So it's really small. No uh, swimming, Brian. No swimming. I just had to do it for, for science. Um, and uh, <laughs> no, I did not swim in it, but uh, I did see a really nice big blue heron. Um, at this reservoir, which was a nice, it was a nice day. 
Um, and Beth and an intern helped me at this reservoir, which was really appreciated. Um, but anyhow, this is the sediment there. Um, these are the sediment volumes by reservoir. I don't think it's super important to see them, but um, just gives you a sense of where the sediment is. And then I gave a sense of how the, the mass would decrease if you allowed it to dewater. Um, and then last, trapping efficiencies. Um, so the trapping efficiency of a reservoir, just it's a number that says how much sediment is trapped in it as a function of how much comes in. So if you have you know, 10 tons a year coming in um, and eight tons a year get trapped, you would say it's an 80% trapping efficiency. So it's a between number between zero and one. Um, and this equation is taken from um, the Brune rule, which is um, widely applied uh, developed in the Midwest, um, but now used all across the country. Um, and I think or, and this is a modified version of the Brune rule that is more widely applied. Sorry, I forgot about it, but uh, it's from Heinemann, 1981. Um, and the C and I is the C is the capacity of the reservoir, so how much water is in it, which is a which will tell you the residence time of water in it. Big reservoirs, water sticks around for a long time, and most of the sediment drops out. Small reservoirs. Water goes through really quickly, and most of, a lot of the sediment will get transported through. Um, I is the inflow, and so it's a function of watershed area mostly. Um, and so, or you calculate it. Um, so I just calculated an average runoff for the region to get annual inflow. Um, and so trapping efficiencies, intake trapping efficiency is sort of meaningless. Um, it's tiny. The trapping efficiency is really low, and um, it's basically zero. Um, when you do the equation. Um, of course, it's not zero because there's some sediment in it, but Hill Reservoir traps about 40%. Uh, Holly Reservoir traps a little bit more because it has a smaller inflow, um, so a longer residence time. Um, and yeah, they're all about 20% full of sediment. And that's the big takeaways. Any questions? Okay, great. I went really quick just in the interest of time. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks, sure. Brian. Fascinating. <laughs> Brian, you're not allowed to have that much fun doing work now. <laughs> <laughs> we partly looked at this too because, you know, the question was, should we try and dredge these reservoirs while Centennial is down before it gets built because we won't want to take it down for dredging if it's going to happen in the next few years once we have this new treatment facility. So appreciate Brian's work to kind of answer the question if it was worth it at this time or not. So. Yeah. yeah, that was great. And going out in the canoe was fun too. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so I, I mean, I don't want to be, since I did the work, I feel like it's, it's responsible to present the findings and let y'all or slash the town decide. Um, but for two to six percent of storage, I don't think it's worth incurring a great expense personally. Doesn't right, seem well, like it, no. No, it's just interesting because without that data, our guys just see like, you know, the tips of the reeds coming out of the top. And so the assumption is that it must be more full of sediment. And so without the data, you know, the, the perception is that we would have moved forward. And so we appreciated that we were able to bring in Brian to actually get us information to make that decision rather than just, you know, our visual observations that we were seeing above the surface. I think if we were to do anything small there, the, the sediment forebay for the intake reservoir, is that that was pretty deep when we dredged it way back when. And right now you can walk across most of it. It's the, because the road, the gravel road sort of spills into that and, and fills in that sediment forebay pretty quick. Yeah, I think that forebay and the sedimentation basins at Atkins are, you know, more, we've, we've got data on those too. Right. And um, they're a little bit easier great. access. They're kind of a quick yeah. and easy project. You don't have to do too, too much. It's not as involved as a full dredging. So those might actually those might actually pay off a little bit. Yeah. Yep. And you, and you need to know the volumes to do any permitting. So, right. um, and, and we had some volumes already on, uh, on the Atkins basins, but we didn't really know, you know, what Hill and Holly had for volume. So it's all good. We appreciate Brian's work. It was great. Um, 
What is next on our agenda? Oh, uh, MS4, the Stormwater MS4. Um, not sure how you know much you guys are interested in this. It's not really water supply so much, but um, we are moving forward with all the work that we need to do with the MS4 program. We um, have submitted draft bylaws, two different bylaws to town council, and they're they're in the review process right now. And um, those bylaws are are one is called our stormwater management bylaw, and one is um, IDDE, which is illicit discharge detection and elimination bylaw. And basically, they're the bylaws are a first step with the program to give the town the authority to do inspections on private property for illicit connections to our stormwater system, and then also authority to review application or to actually require applications for projects that are going um, in, to involve stormwater, especially when it's going to affect our, our stormwater system. Um, so that's where we are with the bylaws. What else did we do this year? We've put together, we've started inventorying our outfalls, our stormwater outfalls, and we've put together some, some, nice, some nice forms for collecting data at the outfalls and entering that into GIS. Um, and we're doing, we're continuing to do all the public outreach and public education that we started last year. That's really just a continual part of that MS4 program that we have to have to do. We have a, we have a website, uh, we do mailings. We, we try to do projects this year. I would like to do a um, catch basin painting project that we were gonna start last year with the schools, but then the schools all shut down. So, but that's really something I'd like to do for public outreach. Um, I think that's it for MS4. Does anybody have any questions on that? Brian? Yeah, I just want to mention the Fort River Watershed Association collected data on outfalls directly to the fort. And so we have locations and we have, um, I don't remember if I've shared the data with you, Beth, but I can. We have conductivity, temperature, things like that. Yeah, no, I would love all that information okay, as we you know, develop the program. I know you guys are doing doing some good stuff. So yeah, we should definitely communicate and keep sharing. Um, so that's all I have on that. I guess the next is to select a date for our next meeting. And uh, Jack, you had a question about the reuse. Did you want to talk about the? Yeah, I was just, I was just curious. Uh, it seemed like, um, you know, pretty big project. And I, I just really didn't know, you know, how that was going to work. Um, but it was just mentioned that it would be accessible, you know, along West Street at some point in the future. And if someone knows something about it, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to hear about it. Yeah, so um, by way of a little bit of background, um, currently right now, there are um, a couple of trailers that UMass owns that takes some of our wastewater effluent and treats it for reuse and they use that at the central heating plant for you know for a couple of uses on campus um, for re, you know for an alternative water source um, that trailer is kind of nearing the end of its natural life um, so basic, kind of the timing of all of that we are looking at um, building a reuse facility within the wastewater treatment plant so rather than UMass taking our water, treating it, and then using it instead, we would treat it and then send it to UMass. Um, and so at least initially, that would be the user for this reuse water is at least the sources at UMass that are currently using reuse water or that are looking to pipe in the near future. Um, that being said, um, yeah, it's kind of that conversation in the future of are there other you know large uses or you know ways to get it so stuff like the Amherst golf course um you know the fact that um Wildwood middle school and high school are all close together and they have a lot of fields like that's a good cluster of water use um it's just a matter of you know you need to have specific pipes to go to those places and so um that's kind of a future build out sort of thing um but for now we're moving forward with the design um, we're going to be actually doing a bunch of sampling over the next six months to kind of hone in on the specifics of the design of this reuse facility in hopes that we'll have it in the next couple of years um, at the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, I, I know like you have a couple of farms, you know, Mill Road and, and um, 
um, the incubator farm there off West Street, but I can't think of the name right now, but um, just, just curious, but it, it seems like a big kind of infrastructure project to lay, you know, separate piping, but. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's why with some of these, we'll be looking at where there's like clusters of users that it makes sense to run a pipe to somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to kind of balance the number of users versus the length of pipe to get it there. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so we're talking about reclaimed water usage? Yes, yeah. So typically golf courses, parks, uh, places like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any way to incentivize businesses or public golf courses to do that as opposed to paying the water bill for fresh water to irrigate? Well, I mean, part, part of the incentive is that currently right now, you if you pay for water, you're paying the sewer rate as well. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, the cost for reuse water would be, you know, less than the cost of water and sewer combined. Um, we don't know the exact cost because, um, you know, that that's part of the design process, but it'll be, you know, probably close to the water rate. It might be a little higher than the water rate, but definitely lower than the water and sewer combined. Um, but yeah, it's all things that we're your incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's fine. You know, there's a financial incentive there. And, and I imagine the piping wouldn't have to be the, the level of quality of a drinking water line. I don't know if you get away with, you know, cheaper installation, you know, methods versus, you know, drinking water line, but. I don't know. No. Um, you know, it has to be purple, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who we were talking to, but so I think the DEP was saying that there were some people that literally thought that like the water that reuse water was purple that you had to like dye it purple that you know you're like mm. wow people i think that's fuel oil yeah <laughs> red red dye diesel yeah <clears throat> so uh, it's all things that we're exploring but yeah it's um yeah thanks for thanks for bringing that up thank you all right um does anybody have anything else they want to talk about All right, um, for then we can set our, our next meeting date. Um, I think, so do we typically do the third Thursday of the month? Is that, because I've got either the 16th or the 25th of September. They're both Thursdays. One is I think the third and one May, I think there's five Thursdays in the next September. I just wrote down those two dates earlier. Um, so, I guess I vote for the 16th, unless anybody has an issue with that. No? Fine. Okay. Great. September 16th. And hopefully we can actually meet in person, which would be amazing, but yeah, that might be pushing it. We'll see. Zooming is fun. <laughs> All right. Um, it was nice to see everybody um, and keep in touch. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you all. Thanks. Have a good day. Thanks, Brian. Too.